بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله النبي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الله وأكرمني من نور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علمك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين As you know الحمد لله we started the unit four and that is about prophethood this session we want to continue with some of the characteristics of the prophets and then about different messages sent by God and why there have been different Sharia and what is the relation between these different Sharia and if time permits, we'll talk about also Khatmun Nubuwa. We said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided all creatures with a general kind of guidance and hidayatul amma. In addition to that, when it comes to human beings, we have fitra, we have aql. This is on top of instincts that are available in animals. But we said, still we are in need of guidance in the form of revelation. To teach us the things that we are not able to know by ourselves. To emphasize on the things that we can know, but we need, you know, some sanction. And also when there are differences of opinions, disagreements, to give us the final word, so that we don't need to waste our energy on just discussing and arguing and debating and reaching nowhere. So we need revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that He has sent messengers or prophets to all nations. I'm not saying in every generation, but I'm saying to all nations. So maybe, for example, a prophet was sent to China, but not that, you know, for every generation, but at least for the entire nation, a prophet was sent there that if people had appreciated, they could have kept the message. Maybe message is partly uh, preserved, partly not preserved. Anyway, the Quran is very clear. In chapter 16, verse 36, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولقد بعثنا في كل أمة رسولا. We have dispatched, we have raised in every nation a messenger. أن عبد الله واجتنب الطاغوت. And the core message was the same: to serve God and avoid the devil. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ حَدَ اللَّهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ حَقَّدْ عَلَيْهَا الضَّلَالَ Some of them are guided, some of them are misguided. فَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضَ You should travel all over the world to see what happens to the people. فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ Especially see what was the end of the people who rejected the messengers. Where are they now? Or in chapter 35, verse 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We have sent you truthfully as a Bashir who gives good news and as a warner, Nadir. But in general, There has been no nation unless a warner has been sent to them. So, to all nations, a messenger, a warner has been sent. There is one more verse in the book. وَيَقُولُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِ 
انما انت منذر ولكل قوم طال الله سبحانه وتعالى in this verse which is verse 7 of chapter 13 also says that for every people there is a guide لكل قوم طال this is one of the verses that we use for امامه you see there must be a guide for every people and guide according to the Quran is the one who guides without being in need of guidance inshallah in imam we will talk about it afaman yahdi ila alhaqq ahqqa an yattaba amman la yahdi illa an yuhda according to the Quran guide in this sense is the one who doesn't need to be taught who doesn't need to be guided okay so to all nations allah has sent messenger one of the things also that the quran tells us is that these messengers spoke the same language of people ma arsalna min rasulin illa bi lisan qaumihi if allah sent to arabs he spoke arabic if allah sent to for example um, those who spoke aramaic they spoke aramaic if they were speaking hebrew yes prophet spoke hebrew so it was bil lisan qaumihi and once you know i had a discussion with someone and i said i think if allah is go- was going in the past send a prophet to england the prophet should uh, speak english not speak in you know, arabic or farsi or urdu because allah said ma arsalna min rasulin illa bi lisan qaumi if a prophet was coming here was uh, speaking english he was uh, sent to france he was uh, speaking french okay so the main thing is that there must be no barrier between the messenger of god and people and i think this is very clear it's a matter of wisdom if you want your message to reach people so one of the requirements is that that prophet should speak the same language of people so that people can understand him and also they should feel that he is one of them when you speak people's language people feel close to you yeah also the quran tells us that the prophets were human beings this is another aspect of unity if the prophets were angels for example angels who were sent by allah to speak to us to communicate to us they could not play the same role because we could feel that they don't understand us they are not you know going through the challenges that we go through they cannot be a very good role model for us because they don't have you know body physical needs you know desires all these things that human beings have but when a person who is a human being is sent makes it very easy like for example uh, the ayatun nafr you know ayatun nafr ma kana al mu'minun li yanfaru qafah falawla nafara min kull firqatin minhum ta'ifah li yatafaqahu fi al-din wa li yunziru qawmahum idha raja'u ilayhim la'allahum yahbarun Allah says it's not possible for all the believers to travel but why from every group some have not traveled to go to medina and learn islam and then go back to their people and teach them so that they may get lesson they may you know develop respect and devotion and become god fearing la'allahum yahbarun so it's very important that from every group of people some people go to hose to places of learning they learn and go back 
so that they can warn their own people, they can talk to their own people, they can preach their own people, because then people feel unity. Okay? So, to every nation, a messenger has been sent. The messengers have spoken the same language. They were human beings, like us. Even in some cases, for example, like Prophet of Islam, Allah emphasizes on the fact that he was also one of the same people. Not only he was a human being who spoke the same language, he was one of the same people. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ He was one of them. So if they were, for example, Arabs, he was Arab. They, he, he was from Mecca, he was from Quraysh. At least the first addressee who were those people in Mecca and Medina and Arab Peninsula, they could feel closer. Of course, when the message is established and then it grows and is spreads to all over the world, then you cannot have a person who is from all the nations. He has certainly one nationality or you know one kind of ethnicity. But to begin with, this was very important and this was the dua of Ibrahim and Ismail that they ask Allah Babaat fihim Rasulan Minan Fusihim. They ask a messenger to be sent to their progeny who is from them. A messenger for them and from them. Indeed, they were you know asking something great. They wanted a messenger for their progeny, but they also wanted that messenger to be from their progeny. Yes, very ambitious. This is good. In dua, you should be ambitious. So, this is a general idea about sending prophets and messengers to all nations with their language, you know, and all these things. How many prophets have been sent? The Quran doesn't mention the number, the total number. But according to a hadith, Abu Dhar reports from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that there were 124,000 prophets, Nabi. 124,000 Nabi. And out of them, there were 313 Rasul, messenger. Messengers are prophets, are Nabi, but it's not that every Nabi is Rasul. Mm -hmm. Every Rasul is Nabi, but every Nabi is not necessarily Rasul. Nabi is the one who receives revelation. So all the Anbiya, all the Rasul, which are Anbiya, they receive revelation, they receive Wahy. But Rasul are those people who had a special message, a special mission. Many Anbiya, they were just like teachers, like just ulama, who preached the Sharia of the Prophet who was given Sharia, a messenger who was given Sharia, either contemporary to them or before them. So in Bani Israel, for example, there were many Prophets, sometimes tens of Prophets, but they preached the same message of messenger of that time. Okay, some of the people who are mentioned in the Quran by name are like Adam, Allah Nabina wa Ali wa salam, Prophet Noah, Abraham, Ishmael, Lot, Jacob, Joseph, Jah, Moses, Arum, David, Solomon. John, Yahya, Zakaria, Yunus, Isa, Jesus, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, 27 prophets are mentioned by name in the Quran. But the Quran says there are many that we have not mentioned. In verse 78 of chapter 40, 
Allah says, there are many that we have not mentioned their names. There are many that their stories are not mentioned in the Quran. Because imagine, you cannot mention the names and the story of 124,000 prophets. But those who were more important for us to know, they are mentioned. And among these five are Ulul Azm. Fasbir kama sabara Ulul Azm min al Rusul. The prophets of great determination. Inshallah, next session we will talk about Azm, about determination. It is interesting that out of 124,000 prophets, how many are messengers? 313. Out of 313, five are selected. So these are the select of the select. And they are called Ulul Az. It shows the importance of determination. What do you need for your success? You may need different things. But the main key to success is what? Determination. determination. If you are determined to do something, 99% of the cases you would it if you have determination if you don't have determination even if you have everything you will not succeed you know look at for example lives of great scientists scholars whether it be muslim non-muslims you know different fields you find sometimes there are people who were very poor they were not even able to get access to books, to libraries. Some of them were not even, you know, uh, having, you know, good schooling. But because they were determined, they became great scholars. Even we read about some ulama that they didn't have light at home. Okay? In the past, they used to have, you know, this, uh, like, you know, candle or oil, you know, they burn oil. So it was not something that everyone could afford. So some of them used to go outside and read outside near a house, which for example, has put a candle on their door or, you know, something like this. They, they didn't have, you know, light it at home. Now we have lights, we have, you know, chair, we have desk, we have carpet, we have, you know, heater, we have electricity, everything, air conditioning, <laughs> coffee, fridge, everything. But what we don't have is that determination. Yes? You know, when we want to study, we want, you know, to have no problem. It's impossible to have no problem. You have to have determination. You know, if you look at, for example, the late Sahib Jawahir, Sheikh Muhammad Hassan al Najafi, he has produced 43 volumes of Jawahir. Jawahir al Kalam, the, uh, one of the great faqih jurists of our contemporary time. 43 volumes and each page is so deep that ulama believe if someone can understand one page of Jawahir he is mujtahid. If you can really understand even one page of Jawahir is much, you are mujtahid. One person single-handedly without having you know a team without having you know funds without having even a fan in hot weather of najaf has produced 43 volumes of masterpiece that now it's impossible for any shia faqih to issue fatwa without reading what he said Determination is very important. Inshallah, we will talk about this. 
So out of 313 messengers or apostles or Rasul, the plural is Rasul, Mursaleen, five are chosen as Ulul Azm. Prophet Nuh or Noah, Ibrahim or Abraham, Moses or Musa, Jesus or Isa, and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. According to the Quran, who was the first messenger who was given Sharia, a code of law, a system of law? No. Prophet Nuh. Shara'a lakum min ad-deen ma bassa bihi Nuhan. Before Prophet Nuh, Allah Tabatabai Rahmatullah Alayhi Al Mizan explains. Before Prophet knew there was no Sharia. There was no code of law. There were moral teachings. There were, you know, aqa'id, you know, like Tawheed, Ma'ad, yeah. But to give a set of law it started in the time of Prophet Nuh. Because before that life was not very complicated. Human society was not that much, you know, developed. So they were not in need of a code of law. Prophet Nuh was the first person who was given Sharia. And then other, you know, uh, prophets who were given Sharia, like Prophet Musa, Prophet uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent different prophets? Why he sent different shara'id, different sharia? The reason for sending different prophets is because Allah wanted to communicate to all people of the world and they were very divided and scattered and there was no way also to communicate from one place to all over the world. So Allah sent different prophets. Also, they were not able to preserve the message. So Allah had to send books one after the other. One reason for sending books one after the other was because they were not able to preserve the book. The other reason was because they were not able to receive very complicated and sophisticated book. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to teach them just enough for that period. Also, the situations were changing. So the Sharia sometimes had to change. But when we reached the time of Islam, we have a change. The change is that now, first of all, the book is preserved. So people have reached the point that they can preserve the divine book. Even during the life of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, there were many, many memorizers of the Quran. Even in one battle of Muta, 70 Hafiz of Quran were killed. Imagine how many Hafiz were there that just in one battle, 70 people were killed. How many Hafiz took part in the battle? That's out of them, 70. And how many people were all together there? Right from the time of the Prophet, writing down the Quran was also happening. You know, there were people who were commissioned, they were asked by the Prophet to be writing down the Qur'an. They were called Qutabul Wah. They were writing, they were registering Wah. And you know, the story of compiling the Qur'an, the story that Amir al put the whole Qur'an with commentaries and the stories about when and where 
each verse was revealed together, all these things. So the book was preserved, one point. Also, people reached that level of understanding that they were appreciating the word, the speech. You know, we have a discussion about Mu'jiza, inshallah, we'll talk about it later. But briefly, every nation was given a type of miracle that suited that nation. In the time of Prophet Musa, what was the most important thing? What was the great art? Magic. Sihr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Musa alayhi salam miracles that suited that era. And this is why when Pharaoh wanted to defeat Musa alayhi salam, called the magicians. But this miracle was much more than magic. Therefore, the magicians were the first people to admit. In the time of Prophet Isa salam, what was great thing? The most important thing was medicine. Medicine was very important. And Allah made Isa salam able to do something that no medical doctor or physician was able to do. No one was able to give life to a statue of bird. No one was able to give vision to the people who were born as blind, to revive the dead. So, it suits medicine, but it's not medicine. Something that all medical doctors would say, this is not medicine. This is not something that even we are hoping to achieve in future. You know, the difference is so great that medical doctors would not say, yes, he is using a type of herb or you know some kind of treatment that maybe after some years we also realize like magicians they didn't say maybe he has a type of magic that we can also learn no they realize it's totally of different nature miracles of isa was of, uh, of different nature but is still relevant and suitable for that time in the time of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the most important thing for people was their language. For Arabs, Arabic was the most important thing. You know, they were very careful about their language. They were very amazed by poem and eloquent language. Even, you know, one of the habits of them was they used to send their children to desert to live among the Bedouins so that they have pure Arabic. Because people of Mecca used to receive lots of visitors, yeah? For trade, for uh, tawaf. Many people used to go there. Not like today. <laughs> But still, many people used to go there. And they were afraid that if their children are brought up in Mecca, they would pick up some words which are not pure Arabic, or their accent might be distorted. So they used to send their children to desert, so that they grow in desert, learn pure Arabic, also become strong because you know in desert you know you have to be strong and also to have good you know Arab you know characteristics so language was very important for them inside Kaaba there were seven pieces of poem that were hanging on the wall they were called Mu'allaqat <laughs> Sabah no, not only they had idols inside Kaaba, they had seven pieces of poem. It shows how much poem was important for them. These seven pieces of poem were masterpieces for them. Now imagine 
Allah sending Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to people who are so impressed by the language and so much, you know, proud of their language. And now Rasulullah is going to speak to these people in Arabic. The same letters, the same grammar, but when Rasulullah speaks, they say, this is not a word of human being. Those who were honest, they said, this is the word of God. Those who were dishonest, they didn't want to say this is the word of God, but they could not say this is the word of a human being. So they said, he is taught by jinns. Or he is a magician. He is using power of magic so that we cannot resist against this word. They were so worried about the power of attraction of the Quran that they used to tell people that whenever you go for tawaf and you see Muhammad there reciting the Quran, don't stand next to him. And even if you are walking or doing tawaf around, put cotton inside your ear so that you don't hear. Is this rational? Why you are afraid of listening to the Quran? Today, most of us don't understand the beauty of the Quran because we are not, you know, experts. We are not, you know, that eloquent. You know, like for example, um, in Farsi we say, Qadr zar zar gar who knows the value of gold? Those who sell gold. Okay? There is a story. Once a person gave a ring to someone. And said, you know, go to the market of those who sell, you know, metal and iron, make, you know, swords and, I don't know, knife and these type of things. Okay, Haddad. You know Haddad? Those who sell iron. So he took this ring there. They said it doesn't have any value because one kilo of iron is maybe, for example, 10 cents. What is the value of one ring? It's just two grams. So he went back and he said, they said it has no value. He said, okay, now take it to the market of those who sell jewelries. Those who sell jewelries, for them, it's not important what is the weight. Yes, they look at this and they said, oh, it's thousands of dollars or pounds. So the same thing was evaluated totally differently. Why? Because the first people were not experts. You know, unfortunately, Sometimes, you know, in some, you know, uh, countries in the Middle East, people had old manuscripts and they just used to, you know, sell it uh, in the market very cheap. And there were many people, you know, from, for example, you know, libraries, from museums, you know, from Western countries, they used to buy these books very cheap from them because those people who were selling, they didn't know the value. Yeah, so if you were giving them, you know, for example, one dollar for one book, they were very happy. Because even new book is not one dollar. You know, he said, I sold an old book one dollar. This man was crazy. He gave me one dollar, you know. Not knowing what is the value of manuscript. I don't know if you have been to uh, Ayatollah Marash's library in Qom. So this library is one of the most important libraries in the world whole Islamic world. There are hundreds of thousands of books. But the library started first, not as a library, it started first as a personal effort of Ayatollah Marashi, Najafi, when he was in Najaf, as a student. He was very sad to see important manuscripts are being sold. And people don't know the value, they sell it to foreigners and they take it and we lose these 
the important things. And he was a talab and he had no money. So he decided to eat two meals instead of three meals. So he reduced one meal so that he saved some money. And he started doing salat istijar and uh, fasting of, you know, when you are hired to fast or pray on behalf of someone and you get some money. So he used to do this for many years and buy these books. So he managed to purchase many of these books and then when he came to Qom and he became, you know, Marja, he built this library and he started buying more. And then Imam Khomeini uh, asked the Iranian government to give him more money. So they expanded the library. Now, mashallah, it's a very good library. And they have also modern you know, technology to preserve the book, to restore the book. Even they have a storage that it's anti, you know, uh, rocket or missile. So if, you know, those valuable things. But it all started one Talab in Najaf who was seeing these books are so, so cheap and he was not happy and he put some pressure on himself. Actually, it's determination. Anyway, those who don't know value of something, they take it easy. But those Arabs, they were very, very particular about language. But when they listened to the Quran, they found it different. Like the magicians who looked at the miracle of Musa and said, it's different. There's a beautiful story that once three leaders, or maybe more than three leaders, at least three leaders, I, I have in my mind three leaders of Quraysh and Mecca, who had asked everyone not to listen to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, met each other around Fajr outside the house of the Prophet. And they realized that each of them was there the whole night recite, listening to the recitation of the Prophet, thinking that no one would realize. So they were listening to the Prophet but asking people not to listen to him. So when they met each other, they said, this is very bad. We are leaders of Quraysh and Mecca. And if people you know, realize that we come ourselves to listen, this would be very bad. So they promised each other and made vow that they won't do this the same, you know, again. The next night, everyone thought others are not coming. So they went again, and they saw again each other. They promised, but the third time repeated. Then the third time they made, you know, big wow that we don't do this. So even the most hostile enemies of Islam, they were not able to deny the attraction of the Quran. Once they decided to accept the challenge of the Quran. You know, Quran has a challenge, tahaddi. First, the challenge was bring something like the Quran. If you bring something like the Quran, then you would withdraw from saying that this is the word of God. They were not able to bring something like the Quran. Then the challenge was made to bring. 10 chapters, 10 surah, 10 pieces like Quran. They were not able. Then the challenge was reduced. Bring one surah. And still no one has been able to bring. They have brought things which were ridiculous. So once they asked three master, masters of Arabic, that please produce something like one third of what has been revealed so far. And we give you one year and lots of money. So they thought one person cannot do this, so they chose three masters and said, everyone produces something, you have one year time, 
after one year we put it together and we say this is what we have produced but after one year everyone said I was stuck with the first ayah of the Quran and I was not able to continue and those three ayats that they were stuck with are mentioned in the books one is the ayah about the flood in the time of Prophet Nuh when Allah says to the sky and the earth, you know, what to do. So each of them were stuck with the first ayah. So, in the time of Prophet of Islam, وسلم, we have this phenomenon that word was very important, language was very important, text was very important. As I said, they used three texts inside Kaaba. So, the book was preserved, the book was appreciated and now there is no need to send a new book. We just need to make sure that we continue having proper interpretation. And this is what Imams did. Inshallah we talk about this Khatmul Nubov and more inshallah in the next session. So just to finish this. There were many prophets because they had to be sent to different parts of the world or they had to renew what was lost or sometimes because there were many pious people and sometimes in the same town Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose many people as prophets. But those who were given books are not that many. It's not that you know 124,000 books were given or you know all the messengers were given books. No, there were some people who were given books. As we know from the Quran, in addition to the Quran, we have Torah, we have Injil, we have Zabur of Dawood and we have Suhuf of Ibrahim. Maybe there were more books, but these are the books which are mentioned in the Quran. But for sure, not 124,000 books. Certainly not 124,000. Inshallah, we will continue this discussion in the next session. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا And الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Do you have any questions?